These men and women from the 19th century to the digital age knew the best. Tricks for turning misguided trust into personal gain. Many would agree it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there where hustling, cutting corners, and occasionally lying is necessary if one wants to stay on top. Of course, some people push the envelope too far. Here are five of the most notorious con artists, grifters and swindlers from the 19th century onward. Cassie Chadwick Cassie Chadwick was born Elizabeth Bigley on March 28, 1857 in Apan, Ontario. She was the third daughter in a family of two boys and six girls born to Daniel and Marion Bigley. Life on the straight and narrow was never in the cards for Elizabeth Bigley, who went by numerous aliases while defrauding banks and deep-pocketed investors through the Northeast and Midwest for more than two decades. Alternately posing as an heiress and a clairvoyant, Bigley first encountered trouble in the 1890s when she was imprisoned in Ohio for three and a half years for forging checks. Reappearing in Cleveland at the end of the decade, she married a wealthy widower and proceeded to burn through his money, purchasing expensive clothes, jewelry, and furniture. But a lavish domestic lifestyle wasn't enough for the grifter now known as Cassie Chadwick. She started a rumor that she was the illegitimate daughter of steel tycoon, Andrew Carnegie, through which she was able to access loans and cash advances from an increasing number of lenders. One bank owner smelled something rotten by late 1904, however. Her failure to repay the $190. Oh, promissory note caused the web of lies to collapse. Following a high-profile trial in early 1905 that drew a curious Carnegie out to Cleveland to see the proceedings for himself, Chadwick died after less than a year in prison. George Parker George Parker was born in New York City to Irish parents. He had four brothers and three sisters and was a high school graduate. The expression, if you believe that, I have a bridge to sell you is supposedly a nod to American con man George Parker, who made a living as a purveyor of New York City's Brooklyn Bridge through the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Parker typically won over on suspecting immigrants with offers to work in A, yet dash to dash B built toll booth before smoothly convincing them of the potential of buying the bridge outright. Occasionally, this resulted in police shutting down construction work from the confused victims who were trying to get their toll booths up and running. Parker also sold phony deeds to other city landmarks like the Statue of Liberty, Grant's Tomb, Madison Square Garden, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, though he remained most proud of his continued success with the famous bridge. When he sold Grant's tomb, he would often pose as the general's grandson, and he set up a fake office to handle his real estate swindles. Parker was convicted of fraud three times. After one arrest around 1908, he escaped the courthouse by calmly walking out after donning a sheriff's hat and coat that had been set down by a sheriff who had walked in from the cold outdoors. After his fourth conviction on December 17, 1928, he was sentenced to a mandatory life term at Sing Sing Prison. He spent the last eight years of his life incarcerated there and was popular among guards and fellow inmates who enjoy hearing of his exploits. Parker is remembered as one of the most successful con men in the history of the United States as well as one of history's most talented hoaxers. Mary Wilcox Mary Wilcox was a straightforward imposter but with real style. In April 1817, the residents of Almondsbury, England, were surprised to find a mysterious woman in a shawl and colorful dress wandering around their village. She spoke an indecipherable language, though she seemingly referred to herself as caribou and her recognition of exotic fruits like pineapples suggested that she came from Asia. Eventually, a Portuguese sailor agreed to translate for the stranger, relaying the information that she was a princess from the Indian Ocean island of Javasu who had escaped a kidnapping attempt by pirates. Upon release from Stir, Princess Caribou was remanded to the local magistrate, Samuel Whirl, and his family. She demonstrated ability with a bow and arrow, knew how to fence, swam naked, and pray to Alatalo, all of which confirmed her tale. Princess Caribou's story was corroborated by several authorities, including a doctor, Wilkinson, who identified her language. Magistrate Whirl proposed to investors a Javasu spice deal facilitated by the princess. Her picture appeared in British newspapers. 
This queried the con. A boarding housekeeper saw her picture in the Bristol Journal and recognized the princess as Mary Wilcox, a cobbler's daughter from Devon. Undaunted by the revelation, Whirl and Mary continued to exploit the princess bit absent any lucrative Javasu deals. He paid her way to the U.S., where Princess Caribou played Philadelphia to little success. A tough house, Philadelphia, even for a princess. Princess Caribou, Mary returned to England, maybe attempting other gigs in France or Spain. On September 13, 1817, there was a write-up in the Bristol Journal linking her with Napoleon exiled on street. Helena at the time. Apparently he was so fascinated, he petitioned the Pope for dispensation to marry her. Mary eventually did marry to a fellow named Richard Baker in 1828. They had a daughter the following year. Mary died in 1864. Bertha Heyman. Born in 1851 in Kobli, near Posen, in Prussia, Bertha Schlesinger, later known as Bertha Heyman, was a 19th century swindler dubbed Big Bertha or the Confidence Queen that was because she managed to swindle people out of thousands of dollars. In fact, she sometimes even did so while incarcerated. Heyman arrived in America in 1878 and sources say she was married twice, although it seems unclear if she was married the first time or if she got a divorce. Those who believed she was married say that her first husband was a mechanic named Fritz Carco. She lived with him in New York and then they moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin. There she married another man she identified as John Heyman, from whom she took the surname Heyman. Bertha Heyman usually relied on well rehearsed and bold schemes to con money out of people and the people she conned were usually men. She regularly pretended to be a wealthy woman unable to access her great fortune and in need of funds. Her scams generally involved her staying at the most luxurious hotels, being waited on by servants and bragging about her influential friends such as the Astors or the Vanderbilts. Heyman told the New York Times in 1883 that she was only interested in getting money, not in having or spending it, and claimed that she gave the bulk of her ill-gotten funds to the poor. As to why she favored swindling to survive that can be discovered in her philosophy regarding life. Apparently, she was once quoted as saying, I take no pride in overveiling a fool. The moment I discover a man's a fool, I let him drop but I delight in getting into the confidence and pockets of men who think they can't be skinned, it ministers to my intellectual pride. Barbara Arney Our scammer extraordinaire, Barbara Arney, was nicknamed Golden Booze thanks to her vibrant strawberry, blonde hair. She was born in the village of Feldkirch to a homeless couple and as a young woman, married to Roller Franz, a notorious criminal, in 1779. We can only presume that her hard scrabble life and subsequent marriage taught her the art of scamming very effectively. The golden booze would travel with a large wooden chest, staying overnight at an inn or farmhouse. She'd say that the chest was filled with treasure and demand that it be kept in a most secure location. The next morning, guess what? The chest would be missing, along with whatever valuables the mark possessed in this most secure space. The scam was a simple one. Inside the chest resided an accomplice of small stature. When all were asleep, he'd extract himself, gather the host's valuables and the chest, and disappear into the night. This scheme worked at least 17 times. Then Barbara and one assumes the little guy were caught in Ashen, Liechtenstein, and imprisoned at Vaduz on May 27, 1784. Though Liechtenstein was something of a sanctuary principality at the time, the court decided that the golden booze be made an example. On February 26, 1785, before a crowd of more than a thousand people, Barbara Arney was beheaded. She was to be the last person executed in Liechtenstein, which finally got around to abolishing the death penalty in 1987.